Church, we are so glad that you are joining us this morning for worship. Whether you are at home sick or on vacation or joining us for the very first time, we welcome you. Go to our website at sharingbythesea.com and check out our newsletter and see how you can get connected with our church family. All right, as we prepare for worship, take a look at these announcements. Good morning and welcome.
Good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Why wouldn't we be glad? This is, this is the day. It's a day made for us, for our refreshment, for our renewal, for our revival. And Sharon Church is once again coming back. <laughs> we get knocked down and we come back. You know why? Because we're resurrection people. We're the people of God. We are resurrection people. You can knock us down, but we'll always come back as long as we're holding on to Jesus. Amen? As long as we're holding on to Jesus, nothing can stop us from thriving. Welcome. If you're visiting, we're glad that you are here today, and we have for you cards if you'd like to fill one of those out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by. I'd love to know what brought you to Sharon today. For the rest of us, just keep paying attention to information in your bulletin and the newsletter about events happening in the life of the church family. Today, I, I want to lift up just a couple of things from the bulletin on the announcements page. We still have about 10 of the tickets left to go to the Pelicans game next Sunday, and that's going to be a lot of fun. If you're concerned about the price, just come and we'll get you a ticket anyway. We have some folks that have offered to sponsor people that want to go to the Pelicans game. And so that's next week, and I'm ready. I might bring my glove to try to catch a but then again, I could need a hot dog if I have my hands full of glove. Anyway, that's next week. I also want to lift up to you that Lori Miner has set up a little display out here to get a jump start on Operation Shoebox, the Christmas gift uh, ministry through Samaritan's Purse. And so Lori's over here in the green. She is coordinating that for us. And also a box around the corner here that uh, Mount Calvary Institute of Leadership Development, who we're partnering with through the Crossing Network, collecting school supplies for needy kids in our county. So there's operations in place for us to be generous uh, beyond the, the giving to the church. So we're grateful for that. I also uh, would just call your attention to our prayer list, which is opposite of that, underneath the uh, ministry focus that we have regarding the response to the key. And so please read that. Be look for opportunities. There's already opportunities to give money, and that money will go directly to flood relief in Kentucky, but there may be other opportunities to be more hands-on. We'll just keep uh, praying for that situation as it unfolds, but what we know that's a real need right now. That's not something that might happen. That's something that has happened, and those folks have been suffering now for a couple weeks. So uh, pay attention to those things. Want to lift up our prayer list to you. We have what's in the bulletin, and then we also have some that have been turned in this morning written in our prayer book. So join us in praying for Jackie Leonard, Dusty Varnum, Irvin Davis, Helen Ellery, Hamilton, Lila Gudelock, Becky Johnson, Bill Estes, Richard Radcliffe, Billy and Mary Andrews, Belinda Dixon, Joanne West, Helen Gabriel, Mary Bird, Garrison Cox, who is a cousin of Michael, who's not here today, but we're lifting him up. Uh, Dwight and Beth Suggs, and yeah, Ryan Todd. And we just continue to lift up young Grace and the, the whole family involved in her recovery as well. And the persecuted Christian church in the world that we're lifting up this week is the church in Cuba. But now we pray, God, that your spirit would descend upon us as we worship you in spirit and in truth.
pray that you would find us worship worthy, that not only would we be refreshed and revived today, but that you would receive a maximum glory. We lift up our neighboring churches and pray that you'd bless them as they worship you, that the whole world would know of your kingdom, of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. In his name I pray, amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. Nothing can separate Even if I run away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes You got new mercies for me every day Your love never fails Thank you. 
seat, everybody. Have a seat. And I invite the kids to come up. I know we have some kids out there, and I have something bright colored and shiny. I thought it might attract somebody to come up. Kids of all ages, anybody that wants to know what's going on up here, gather around. Pastor Jim brought something out of his garage today. You know what this thing is? Say it. You live on the beach. You all have one of these. What is this? A boogie board. A boogie board. Now listen, I know that the pastor who used to be here, who probably baptized y'all, he was into surfing. And I have to say, I didn't grow up near the beach. I don't know how to surf. But I can ride this boogie board like nobody's business. I haven't been able to do it this year, but I, I want to know if maybe you would like to have a boogie board and party with Pastor Jim sometime. Would you like that? Can you pretend that you might like that? <laughs> have a boogie board and party? How about anybody out there? Anybody want to go boogie board? I think we just need to put a date on the calendar. Somebody needs to drive us down on that old bus, drop us off for like 10 minutes, and we go boogie boarding. <laughs> What's fun about boogie boarding is that you have to catch the wave just right. But if you catch the wave just right, it'll just carry you until you end up with your face in the sand or maybe a bunch of starfish stuck to your nose. But it's hard to ride a boogie board at first. In fact, you have to put this strap on to keep you safe in case the wave blows you over. You won't lose your boogie board. It's important to time, time it just right. If you go too early to get on the wave, the wave just kind of crashes over your head and you don't go anywhere. If you miss the wave and then you try it, nothing happens. But boy, is it fun. At just the right time, you launch off in that boogie board, you catch that wave and ride it all the way into the beach. That's fun. That is super fun. Riding a wave on a boogie board is kind of like being in God's will. I know that's maybe a tough thing to talk about, but when we are doing the things that Jesus wants us to be doing, and we're doing it at just the right time, with just the right people, with just the right attitude, it'll take us the places where God wants us to go, doing the things that God wants us to do, and we can ride that wave right on to loving people and being kind and respectful and even having some fun along the way. It's important that we have fun together as a church family. It's also important that we go together and try to catch the wave of what God is doing. Because if we as a church family catch the wave of what God is doing, neat things are going to happen all around us. I just promise. Now, I'm hoping someone will follow up with me on this. And if you, if you know about surfing, we can talk about that. But all I know how to do is this. And if I and if I can get some of you to go boogie boarding with me, I think my heart would be full. That it would be really, really fun. Maybe we could even put some ice cream into the deal. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I pray that these kids would learn how to catch the wave of your spirit and move in the places in just the right times that you call them to. I pray that our church family would have fun together as we learn about you, as we worship and sing, and as we play, and as we learn. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus, who could walk on water. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house today. It's a wonderful thing to know that in this world, it's so chaotic, where the winds and the waves of our lives are in some ways battering us and keeping us from getting to the places we want to go, we know that you are here. We don't have to ask you to be with us because you are. You're always with us. You always have been. You are now. You always will be. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of everything. And you created us in your image. And you called us good. And we praise you for that. Thank you, God, for giving us life, for giving us the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the family that we sit down to worship and to eat meals and to press into this life that you have given us. Thank you for the abundance of your provision for us. And we thank you for our church family here at Sharon. We ask your blessing on us here that are physically present and all those who are watching online or the ones who watch later today. Bless us all, God, not for our own benefit only, but so that we can bless others and so that we can be a blessing to you. We want to see you glorified, Lord. We want you to have maximum glory. You created us to worship you. You created us to be part of your family, and you welcome us with open arms. Especially pray, Lord, during this day that we will finish our service of Holy Communion that you remind us of the precious gift of our salvation that was won through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who went to the cross to pay the debts for our sinfulness, for our disobedience, for our arrogance, for our pride. Thank you that Jesus, you didn't stay in the grave, but you rose from the dead, that you ascended into heaven, and that you've been pouring out your blessings on us. Thank you for the Spirit that allows us to rise above the things of this world that would pull others down. Thank you for the resilience of our church family, and we do lift those up who continue to be in the need of prayer. For those on our prayer list, for those in our minds and in our hearts, for situations that are beyond our ability to give everything that's required for things to get better. And so we always, Lord, lift up to you the sick, the homeless and the dispossessed, those who are facing anxiety and depression, for those even this morning who woke up and are thinking about ending their lives. Lord, it breaks our heart to know about the suffering of others and so help our church family continue its work to come alongside of those who are hungry, who are lonely, who are involved in chronic poverty, who have a poverty of spirit, poverty of soul. Help us to be encouraged by the victories that we see around us day by day. During these days, we, we certainly, Lord, look for your guidance in our church family as is not only our leadership, but our entire church body considers opportunities for possible change in our church, how we align ourselves as a church family, how we go about the administrative order of our church. Lord, we need wisdom, we need unity, we need understanding, and we need a, a full dose of your spirit. In fact, we need a double dose of your spirit in these times. Help us to stay together in the spirit of unity in Jesus Christ. And we lift up this nation and our world as there are wars and rumors of more wars, as there's economic turmoil, as people are scrambling to try to make ends meet, to find a way to put a roof over their heads and pay the bills. And of course, we lift up our kids heading back to school and our teachers and our administrators and all the staff that makes a school work. We lift up our homeschool community and partnerships of potential uh, relationship with our church family. We know, God, that you've got a lot going on. And so I pray that we would catch the wave more and more of what you are doing. So that we don't miss anything. So that we won't just 
wash up on the beach of life, having missed the opportunity to be in on what you're doing. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We offer our lives as living sacrifices to you, Holy Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. This time I invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive our tithes and our offerings. praise and glory. And we dedicate these tithes and offerings to you, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I invite you now to join me in saying what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now I'm going to ask you to stand oh, again. <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> We're riding the wave. I missed that wave. Number 698, <laughs> number 698, God of the ages. God of the ages that we have served, God of the ages that we now serve, and God of the ages that we shall serve. Amen. Let's sing together.
morning church family the lecture reading is Psalm 37 27 through 34 depart from evil and do good so you shall abide forever for the Lord loves justice he will not forsake his faithful ones the righteous shall be kept safe forever but the children of the wicked shall be cut off the righteous shall inherit the land and live in it forever. The mouths of the righteous utter wisdom, and their tongues speak justice. The law of their God is in their hearts. Their steps do not slip. The wicked watch for the righteous and seek to kill them. The Lord will not abandon them to their power or let them be condemned when they are brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep, keep to his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on the destruction of the wicked. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At the conclusion of this service, we have the opportunity to all come to the Lord's table as this is uh, Communion Sunday. It's really the most important thing a church family does together. And so we want to be in the right frame of mind. I also want you to know if you're visiting that as a United Methodist Church, we are an open table. Anybody who desires to be in love with God or who is in love with God and desires to be at peace with their neighbors is welcome. Because of circumstances we've had here for a few weeks, when we give you the bread today, we're giving it to you in a little condiment cup so that the servers aren't touching that bread. But the, the little juice cup will be there so you can take that cup Eat the piece of bread and drink the juice and set it back on the communion railing. We're going to try to have the servers out here a little further than they were last month, so people that desire some time at the, at the altar during communion can do that. We have an open altar here uh, at Sharon, and I just want to get those things logistically out of the way before uh, I launch into this. So today begins a seven-part message series. We finished up the last one about being a, an incarnational church. I hope you don't forget about that. Um, but today we begin a seven-week series coming out of the book of James. I'm not sure how familiar you, familiar you are with James, but it is uh, 
going to be seven weeks of learning what there is in this little letter. It's called officially the Epistle of James. It's a New Testament book. James is very likely the first New Testament book to actually be written down. That's interesting to know. Somewhere between 45 A.D. and 50 A.D., James wrote this down. That's only 12 to 17 years after Jesus went to the cross. And so his intimate knowledge of Christ comes out in this, this letter for us. It was originally written to Jewish Christians who were living in what we would call the Middle East area. Many Jews were coming to faith in Christ, and because that actually was considered a bad thing by many of the Jews, they were forced to leave cities like Jerusalem and go out and settle in the surrounding Judean area, and so they called that the diaspora. They, these were people living in exile, but James was writing to them to encourage them and to give them advice about practical Christian living. So who was James? I think that's important before we launch into this series. Well, he's the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the son of Joseph and Mary, right? We know that Jesus is the son of Mary and Almighty God. But that family went on in Matthew chapter 13, it lists four brothers of Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but there was James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, as well as some unnamed sisters. We don't know how many sisters there were, but sisters means plural. And so James was part of Jesus' family growing up. That's interesting. Now, of course, this is a lot of tradition, and so we don't know everything about it, but we do know that the tradition of the church is that these are, this is a half-brother of Jesus. At the worst, I guess, he was a cousin, but he knew Jesus personally. He lived with Jesus. He spent time with Jesus. I think that's interesting, don't you? He didn't follow Jesus during that three-year period of time when Jesus was out in the world after his baptism, where Jesus was teaching and preaching and driving out demons and gathering disciples. There's every indication that Jesus' actual biological family opposed that ministry. In fact, they thought he was crazy. At one point, they thought that he'd be better off dead than doing the things he was doing. And so James was a latecomer to the faith in his brother. But we know that in the earliest days in Acts, which talks about the early church and the apostles, in Acts chapter 1, there's a list of people who are at the church meeting, and one of them was James. So right at the beginning of the church, somehow he finally realized that all of that ministry that his brother was about, that he kind of was skeptical about, he suddenly believed. I think that he was there at Pentecost and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he understood for the first time things that he was not able to understand earlier. Tradition, again, it's not in the Bible, but there are people that did some writing in those early days. Tradition has it that he was known by some as old camel knees. Have you ever heard that before? Old camel knees. Because he spent so much time on his knees praying that the calluses had built up on his knees and they looked like the knees of a camel. Can you imagine that prayer life, sisters and brothers? Mm. We know that he was martyred in approximately 62 AD, so about 30 years after his brother died on the cross, James was also martyred at the hands of Jewish leaders. Tradition holds that he was taken up onto a high part of the temple in Jerusalem and thrown over. 
He didn't die right away, and so a bunch of people piled on top of him and beat him to death. That's how Jesus' brother died. And 2,000 years after his letter was written to the early church, the advice and the wisdom that comes from this letter is applicable to us. And that's why we're going to look at this together. Because what was true then is true today. And I'm grateful to be sharing with you advice about the benefits of anyone trying to follow Jesus and to live a righteous life. And so now I invite you to join me in the reading of this epistle. It's the first chapter of James, verses 1 through 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lack in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven in. For the doubter stable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word and to our understanding. This is the word of God for the people of God. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable to you. You are our rock and our salvation. Amen. Hmm. So at the beginning, he offers greetings to the people who would be hearing this letter. Most of these people would not have read the letter. They would have had the letter read to them in a gathering like this. And he doesn't say, hey, this is James, the brother of Jesus, Listen to me, because I'm pretty important. <laughs> he doesn't start out like that. He doesn't start out by saying, if you knew who I was, who my brother was, who I grew up, if you knew my mother was the Virgin Mary, he doesn't say those things. What he says is, I am a servant of God. And I'm a bond servant, not only does servant mean somebody who serves others, but a bond servant is somebody who's made a choice to submit themselves to service to another. And he specifically says, I'm a bond servant to the Lord God, but I'm also the servant of Jesus. And he refers to Jesus not as his older brother, but he receives Jesus in his life and introduces himself is the one who is the servant of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is his Lord. Now, all of you who have brothers and sisters, imagine a context where you would bow down before one of your siblings and call them Lord. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. <laughs> all right, you don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? But that's where he had come to. He is my Lord. I belong to him. His mission is my mission. His people are my people. And I will do anything for him. Let's break this scripture down then after he introduces himself. Like Jesus before him, he acknowledges that true disciples in this world are going to face hardship and trouble and trials. I think it's important for Christians to know that and also to be able 
difficult to talk to other people who are questioning the faith. If you are a Christian, doesn't that mean everything's supposed to be easy for you? We know that that answer is no. As a matter of fact, for Christians, sometimes the trials are even greater because you don't just have the sicknesses and the disappointments and the relationship issues of being part of just the world. But on top of that, there's the pressure and the expectation of being a follower of Jesus and part of the church and the added pressure of needing to represent the Lord, which, if we're doing it right, draws persecution. And so he's saying, hey, listen, not if you face trials. He says when you face trials, all kinds of different trials. When trouble comes, consider it nothing but joy. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials in this world. Woohoo! Which means I think we need to, as Christians, understand there's a difference between joy and happiness. And that joy is actually something that comes from within as a gift from God that has nothing to do with our circumstances. Amen. Joy is something that comes up out of us, like Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, that if, if she knew who he was, he, she'd ask him for water, and she, he'd give her water bubbling up from within her. And so as you face trials, consider it nothing but joy. But then he explains how that could possibly be. Because as their faith is tested, going through those trials, endurance will develop. Patience, some of our translations, will develop. And with endurance and patience developing, then Christian maturity also develops. We grow up. It's hard to tell a child when they're going through something difficult or challenging, like for me, math, this is, you're going to be better off if you work through these problems. You'll be better off if you write this paper. You'll be better off if you run these wooden sprints. So all of those, I had to tell my parents, my teachers, and my coaches, all right, I trust you, because none of that sounds good to me. <laughs> but I trust you. <laughs> and sure enough, it worked. I did get faster and stronger and smarter. I did. We all have experienced that. But in the faith, Christian maturity comes from going through the battles of these things. Most of the best things come out of testing. Correct? Most of the best things come out of testing. We wouldn't design it that way, but it seems to be the way it works. So the next thing that James does is he encourages his audience to consider that they might possibly be lacking in wisdom. The kind of wisdom that would help them navigate their sometimes chaotic surroundings and circumstances. Can you relate to trying to navigate confusing and chaotic circumstances? Can you? Can you? Because... <laughs> Man, I, that gets my attention. I have never been so confused by the things going on in, in our society than I am right now. But thanks be to God, we can still ride the wave and we can get through it. And we can make some sense out of it all. Don't you want to make some sense out of this chaos? This was happening in the early church. It's happening to us today. Says in this letter, if anyone is lacking in wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you. That's pretty good. Just ask God and God will give it to you. So the question is then, what is wisdom? I won't get too much into technical things, but there's knowledge, there's understanding, and then there's wisdom. They go together, but they don't all come at the same time. Knowledge is just gathering information through experience 
or through education, knowledge, going to school, going to training, un getting coached about something. Understanding is knowing or realizing the intended meaning of something. Why would I want to do that? When will this ever become useful? Have you ever said that to a teacher? When will I ever need that? Understanding gives you an understanding of when you, you know that you are doing it because you learned it at some point. You understand why and you don't have to question it. Little kids are always asking, why? Why? People that have an understanding don't ask why so much. We still do, but not as much. Wisdom is taking knowledge and understanding and appropriately applying those things to the circumstances in our lives. We take our knowledge and our understanding and wisdom helps us to appropriately put them in the context so that they are not going to do damage, but they're going to do good. Some people are really knowledgeable and understand how things work and they, they use it as a weapon. There's a term that I, I remember hearing 10 years ago where people are weaponizing things, weaponizing information, weaponizing different understanding. Wisdom says, that's not what that's for. If it's Christian wisdom, if it's godly wisdom, it's for the good of our neighbors, it's the good of our church family, it's for the good of this world. A couple of examples. You might have the knowledge and the understanding of how to play the trumpet. Wisdom says, don't bring the trumpet to a solemn funeral service. Stand up in the middle and play it. That would not be wise. But wisdom might say, if you're in New Orleans and they're having one of those parades for a funeral procession that's a big party, bring the trumpet and blow it like crazy because that's the appropriate use of a trumpet in that context. Wisdom. Wisdom is telling me, I'm not sure if I really ought to get on the boogie board at 55, <laughs> but I think I have enough knowledge and experience to know my limits on that. I know how to ride a skateboard. I do. I used to ride a skateboard all the time. I, the last time I was on one was 40 years ago. <laughs> Wisdom says, no more skate. <laughs> Let's keep going. So James, he's talking about wisdom. So then, knowing the challenges that people face in this often confusing and chaotic world, he offers this. Brothers and sisters, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God. He'll give it to you. That's important. Now, here's two parts about wisdom that come out of that. Number one, wisdom is attainable. My dearly departed mother used to always tell our children that her gray hair automatically gave her wisdom. That she would one day be able to share that wisdom with the children, but until they were old enough, she always knew right because of her wisdom. But Wisdom is attainable even to the young. The Bible doesn't teach us we have to live a long time before we can have wisdom. Wisdom could come to a teenager. Wisdom could come to a little child. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit gives wisdom as a gift. We can all have it. We just need to ask for it. In 1 Corinthians, a letter from the Apostle Paul, he writes about spiritual gifts. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the Holy Spirit gives to people in the church different gifts for the common good. To each 
To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. It's the very first spiritual gift listed here by the Apostle Paul. Others, the utterance of knowledge according to the Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To the other, discernment of spirits. To the other, various kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. And so wisdom is attainable. We just have to ask for it. And secondly, it's the Spirit of God that's the mediator that gives us those gifts and helps them to, to come out when they're, they're needed. Now, do we need wisdom as Christians? <laughs> we do. In the, in the days that Jesus was training his disciples, remember when he said in Matthew 10, listen, disciples, I've, I've given you a lot of knowledge, I've given you a lot of understanding, but now I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Have you ever felt like a sheep among wolves? I'm sending you out there. That's a frightening and, and a chaotic context. So, Jesus says, be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. What Jesus is telling those disciples is the same thing Jesus is telling us. Don't go out there in the name of Jesus into this fallen world with a judgmental, self-righteous wrecking ball. That's not what people need. But wisdom says walk in faith and love. Don't throw out knowledge. Don't throw out understanding. Those are important things. They're critical. But proceed wisely. Proceed wisely. Wisdom pairs well with discernment. You ever been to a restaurant and you see something and they say, this pairs well with this kind of wine or something? Well, wisdom pairs well with discernment. The ability to know what God wants, what God does not want, to be able to sense it spiritually. Wisdom and discernment are a powerful gift to the follower of Jesus. The last thing that Jesus says, or J James says, is he warns his audience not to doubt because one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You're not getting anywhere if you're a wave being tossed around by the wind. Don't go boogie boarding when the waves are just going like this. If there's no wave to catch, get out of there. Get out of there. I wrote this down on Thursday afternoon. The winds, they are a blowing, aren't they? The chaos, the confusion, the things that would cause us to doubt the power of God, to doubt the mission of our church, to doubt the future of our church. There's a lot of choices we're going to be making in the next months and we need wisdom knowledge is good looking up stuff reading that's good understanding some things based on experience that's important we need wisdom and discernment so that we don't miss god's preferred future for this church because if we if we get it wrong, a lot of people are going to be hurt by that. If we get it wrong, our children will not be served well. If we get it wrong, our grandchildren will have problems they don't need to have. If we get it wrong, we're going to be the, the church that doesn't have the blessing of God. And who wants to be that church? We pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment. We pray for God to show us the way. 
And he has shown us the way. When Thomas asked him to show the way, he said, here I am. I am the way. Wisdom tells us to stick close to Jesus. Stick close to the word of God. Pray a lot. And trust. And don't doubt. We, like the disciples, are sometimes feeling like we're on a boat being battled, battered by the wind and the waves, and we need Jesus to bring us to safe harbor and to provide an anchor for an anchor. And I think that what we're about to do is the anchor that Jesus has provided the church. We call it the sacrament the sacrament of Holy Communion, where we can be anchored in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and of the presence of the Spirit. It's more than a ritual. It's a gift. And wisdom tells us that we, we must do this to be faithful Christians. So at this time, I, I invite our leadership that's participating in leading in music and participating in serving the communion if they would slowly make their way forward I'm going to be uh, working with our lay leader Don at this time to prepare the elements we do have some hand sanitizer up here I'm going to get this out of the way you have your hymnals, if you would like to use them for this service, I invite you to turn to page 12. Otherwise, the service liturgy will be on the, on the wall. The words in yellow are words that I will read, and the words in white will read together. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's join together on page 13 for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When we break this bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Jesus? When we drink from this cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? I would invite you all to be patient with us during this process. Uh, every month we do it a different way, trying to do it the right way using the proper application of wisdom. <laughs> Let's be in an attitude of prayer as we serve the servers. As the ushers show you forward, I invite you to take and eat and drink. Remember the altar is open. You can spend some time there.
and understanding and discernment to meet the needs of our times. That we would be good moms and dads and grandpas and grandpas 
neighbors and brothers and sisters. you to ride your wave wherever it takes us. Amen. Amen. So I invite you to rise and receive this benediction. The fullness of God be given to you that you might go now covenant people released for joyful obedience in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Amen. Amen.